Resting in the cradle of three volcanoes is Lake Atitlan in the highlands of Guatemala, a fitting place to begin the story of missionary Stan Rother. For just a ferry ride across the lake is the Indian village of Santiago Atitlan, Oklahoma's Catholic mission to the natives. This is the village, and these are the people with whom Rother labored and lived the life of a village priest. Stan Rother loved these people, and he knew them very well. They called him Father Francisco, and he called Santiago home. He worked here for 12 years. His ministry centered in this 16th century church. Catholicism is not new here. Indians in Santiago have been Catholic since the arrival of conquering Spaniards in 1550. Living next to the church in the rectory, Stan Rother was the last priest to carry on the work of the Oklahoma mission. That work ended in the darkness of July 28th. Three assassins broke into the rectory, went directly to Father Rother's bedroom on the second floor. They didn't find him. He had left. He was aware that he was in danger. However, they found a young catechist and forced him to take them to Father Rother on the first floor, where they shot the priest to death. Ya es la de la mañana, entraron la una menos veinte de la mañana, entraron. Sí. Only one man knows exactly what happened in the rectory that night. This is the man. Francisco Bosell was forced to lead the killers to Rother. He's a wanted man. The government says he's a material witness. But since the murder, he's wisely been in hiding, fearing he too will be killed. With the help of an interpreter, we talked with Francisco after finding him somewhere in Central America. To maintain his safety, we can't be specific. The lone witness to the death of missionary Stan Rother lives with the memory of that night of terror. What did these three men do once they got inside? Did they come directly to him? ¿Qué hicieron estos tres individuos cuando entraron en la casa? Pues entraron, eh, yo no sentí nada. I found when I woke up, all the lights were on. It was upstairs. Uh, I thought perhaps it was uh, Father Francis because we'd arranged that we were going to go out early in the morning and maybe I thought I hadn't woken up. But when I opened the door, uh, they came in and uh, they seized me there. Quería que me, me preguntara dónde está el, el padre. A punto de pistola, yo tuve que enseñar al padre. They asked me to tell them uh, where the father was, where Father Francis was. I wanted uh, to tell them that he was just on the first floor. But at the point of the pistol, they told me that I had to take them uh, to where the father was. Uh, so I, I took them down. They wanted me to tell him to tell him that there was a bomb on the second floor and that he should go and look for it. Um, but I didn't want to tell them that, so I said, uh, Father, they're looking for you. Uh, and he came out and they, they got him there and uh, he fought against them because he said, better that they kill me here than that they take me somewhere else. And uh, at that stage I went back upstairs and uh, left uh, uh, Father Francis uh, still fighting with the three men uh, and uh, about three minutes or five minutes afterwards when I heard from my room uh, two shots uh, and that's when Father Francis died. The government arrested three short Indians from this village. Most men here are small, five foot five or so, and they speak an Indian dialect, not Spanish. Francisco, the witness to the murder, says the assassins were tall men who spoke Spanish. He says the killers are still on the loose, and most of the people in the village agree. They live a life wrapped in hand-woven color, but it's a world tinged by the darkness of extreme poverty. These are the poorest of the poor, the Indians of Guatemala, descendants of the ancient Mayans, that culture crumbled centuries ago. Now, to the people who control and own the wealth of Guatemala, these are second-class citizens, peasants. This was the mission field of Father Stanley Rother. He preached and practiced a social as well as a spiritual gospel. Rother set up a land program that let Indians buy the land they till, unheard of in Guatemala. 
where men and boys carve a living out of soil they don't own. The child's name is Flora Maria. She's three and a half years old and may be starving to death. She's put on some weight but still suffers from malnutrition. The damage to her body has been done and it's not a pleasant sight. She was shown to us as an example of the hunger in Santiago. This nutrition center, part of it hand-built by Stan Rother, may save her life. It may not. It has spared the lives of other children in the village. A lot of them. Father Rother was involved in a lot of social programs. He helped to start a school to start a land program, a hospital, but the very center of his ministry was right here in this church. And when he was murdered, the Indians buried his heart back behind that altar. And now the church has a martyr. While we photographed in the church, we were given an unexpected warning that drove home the reality of Santiago. Just be very careful. Take care. Do what now? Be careful. Say that again, what she said. She says, be careful. Why? The woman is speaking in Zutzahil, an Indian dialect. The translation into Spanish and finally English is confusing, but the message is clear. For nearly a year, the village has been the target of brutal violence. Men dragged from their homes, tortured and slaughtered like animals. Intimidation from gunmen, government troops moving into the city, and fear spreading among the villagers like a sickness. Father Stan Rother's murder was but part of the terror going on in Santiago Atilan. The woman doesn't say who killed Rother or who the kidnappers and killers are. But others who wouldn't talk on camera say the terror began a year ago when the Guatemalan soldiers surrounded the village. They set up camp to catch guerrillas, according to the government. But now there are more than 30 widows and dozens of orphans. Like Stan Rother, caught in the crossfire between left and right, rich and poor. Trapped by the politics of murder. The simple lifestyle of Santiago Atitlan hardly seems the right backdrop for a political struggle. Until a year ago, the pollution of politics was a world away. Weaving was more important than worrying about liberal and conservative or left and right. All of that changed in October 1980. Government troops surrounded Santiago and set up camp outside of town. Soldiers with machine guns began arresting village men, men that were never seen alive again. Armed kidnappers wearing masks began snatching other men from their huts, scattering their tortured bodies across the countryside. Father Stan Rother tried to continue his work as a missionary priest, but fear swept the village as the names of church members and town leaders began to appear on death lists, listings of supposed government opponents targeted for assassination. Father Rother feared for his life because he witnessed and spoke out against the kidnapping of a young catechist from the porch of his rectory. The catechist was murdered, and Father Rother was put on the death list. This man, Diego Keek, was the catechist who was kidnapped and murdered. Keek's name had been on the death list. Rother knew that, but took his close friend into the rectory for safety. An American mission volunteer took these pictures of Keek and his family before he was killed. Frankie Williams witnessed the kidnapping. Uh, we got there just as they were dragging Diego down the church steps and stuffing him in this car. As we stood there, so helpless, so defenseless, you just can't imagine what it's like to stand there and watch someone you've come to know and love being snatched away by people that you know that are going to torture him and kill him. And all the time he's yelling, are you the May? Are you the May? Help me, help me. And uh, it took a few minutes for Father Stan then to kind of stand up again. 
And then because none of us knew what to do, we all formed a circle and had a moment of meditation and prayer because we didn't know what else to do. The prayers for the dead in Santiago were increasing at a fearful rate. Father Rother was told he would be next. Friends convinced him to leave, and grieving, he returned to Oklahoma in January of this year. But five months later, he was back in the village. By August, he was dead. Stan Rother was a missionary. He was not a guerrilla soldier. On the other hand, he was not a politician. He didn't take sides. He just offered some help to people who needed it. And in the situation that exists here in Guatemala, that is probably what cost him his life. Some people say he did his job too well. To a passing motorist in Guatemala, this is not an unusual sight. These two cars were overturned and burned by left-wing guerrillas. Not at all out of the ordinary. Guerrillas battle right-wing death squads constantly in Guatemala, where fear is a part of everyday life. When we arrived in Guatemala, we wanted to rent some type of car, and our preference was a four-wheel drive vehicle, something like a Blazer, maybe a Jeep. We were told that's not the best idea. Those are the vehicles the death squads drive, and the ones guerrillas shoot at. We settled on a red station wagon. Some believe these are the death squad cars. They're parked in front of National Police Headquarters in Guatemala City. Another common sight, a policeman with an automatic rifle, not just a pistol. This is not cops and robbers. Political violence kills in Guatemala. The politicians in power are in the presidential palace at least for now, safely protected by government soldiers. However, many Guatemalans believe there will soon be a change of power, a new government. But until there is, some live a life of fear and hiding. This is a hotel room in Guatemala City. Seems like kind of a strange place to do a news report. But in just a minute, we'll talk with a lady who identifies with, who understands why Father Stanley Rother was murdered. Rose, as we'll call her, has been in hiding for over a month. We can't tell you what her real name is, can't tell you her occupation, can't tell you where she lives. If we did, very honestly, she would be killed. And that is not an exaggeration. Probably some people would think this is foolhardy. And probably many people do not at all understand why. If one's life is in danger, why one just doesn't run. And I perhaps... Sometime, at some future moment, I, I perhaps will have to run. But at this moment, I think that uh, I belong here yet. This all sounds kind of unreal to people who sit in the sofa in America and read their newspaper and hear something about Guatemala. They really don't understand it. They may not believe it. What could you say to people to help them to realize that this is a very serious thing, this is a very real thing? It's hard to explain why is all of this happening, except I think it's because the church has, uh, for the last 10 or 15 years, taken a very clear preferential option for the poor, because that is the great majority of, of the Latin Americans. And the church is not something apart from the people, but it is for the people. It is for the world. And it looks not only to the salvation of every man, but the, the total well-being of people. And so when one begins to live this commitment, there are many implications that perhaps one never thought about sitting back on the sofa. Will this end? Will this ever come to an end? or? Would you say that checking back with you two or three years from now, you're going to be in the same situation? Uh, yes, I have hoped that this will come to some, to some solution. Uh, that's part of what faith is all about.
mixture between old and ancient, Catholicism and Mayan culture. A very special day in the village of Santiago Atitlan. The bishop is here, along with others, for a ceremony of sadness, a mass for Father Stanley Rother, the martyr of Santiago. For a year, this has been a place of terror. Dozens beaten, kidnapped, murdered. Father Rother was only one, but his life was a symbol of hope. Today, his death was a memory of sadness. His vestments are a village treasure here. His translation of the Mass into the Indian dialect of Zutsa Hill is a testament of love. Almost 3,000 people attend. There hasn't been a mass in this church for weeks, not since Father Rother's death. After today, there may not be one again for a long time. Every priest in the area is living and working with the knowledge that they might be killed. Part of this service is individual prayer, a pleading for Father Stanley Rother's soul, an ancient tradition for a new sadness. The cornerstone of the church may be traditional ritual, but there is a new foundation among the Indians of Guatemala. Meetings held in simple native huts, conducted by catechists, lay leaders who spread the religion at the dirt floor, grassroots level. We're hiding this man's face to save his life. The meeting is not illegal, not really political. Yet dozens, perhaps hundreds of catechists have been murdered in Guatemala. Father Rother trained several catechists to work in and around his mission. Almost all have been murdered. Why? The only answer seems to be that these men are telling the Indians that God does not necessarily intend that they should be the poor or slaves to the rich. Dangerous talk in an economy that depends on near slave labor from passive peasants. The atmosphere is a reminder that this is somewhat the way Christians met 2,000 years ago and that murder and terror are not really enough to kill a faith. Thank you. 
understand Rother's involvement with these people was sincere. But why would that lead to his murder? And who was responsible? Last February, Rother went to a justice and peace workshop in Mexico City. The Guatemalan government considers justice and peace a leftist reform group. Rother's attendance may be one of the reasons the government figured the priest was a political activist. However, in a letter written to a friend after the workshop, Rother said he was still not ready to join Justice and Peace or any other reform group. His commitment was to his mission. Saying that he was a priest and not a politician, Rother returned to Santiago. On July 28th, he was gunned down by three unknown assassins. I don't, I don't know where they were, where they were from. They had their heads covered with masks. Okay, how big were the three men who came into the rectory that night? Were they bigger than the average Indian that may live in the village? He doesn't know who they were, but he can describe what they looked like. The man we're talking to is the lone witness to the murder. They were big. They were about the same size as Father Francis. Who was much bigger than people who live in the village? Father, sí, y de que era mucho más grande Padre Francisco que que la gente que vivía en el pueblo. Sí, era grande. Sí, era grande. Yes, he was big. What the witness says is important. He describes the killers as tall, as tall as Father Rother, about my size. This is a scene shot in the village of Santiago. As you can see, the Indian men are short. Almost none of them as tall as I am. Who killed Father Stanley Rother? Well, the Guatemalan government has arrested three short Indian-speaking men. However, the killers are described as three tall Spanish-speaking men. What about left-wing guerrillas? That's not very likely. Guerrillas take pride in killing off political officials, not priests. The evidence points toward the right wing, which includes the Guatemalan government. It is very possible Stanley Rother's murder was authorized or approved by the Guatemalan government or one of its agencies. The man from Ocarchi, Oklahoma, became the victim of a left-wing, right-wing political struggle in which all too often murder is the only solution. Larry Otis, Action 4, Guatemala City.